the house. And all of my kids, I only got three, let me just be clear, uh, <laughs> are in the house today. Come on, shout it out for them. <laughs> Let's encourage them to keep on coming, right? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you and welcome online audience. We appreciate you tuning in today. As Pastor Maria has mentioned, today is part two of our series, Mantra, in which we have been just exploring just some inspirational, you know, many people have these inspiration boards and many people post on their boards some things that they would like to remember or to motivate them or to inspire them. And, and a lot of them, they call them their daily inspiration or their, their uh, aspirational goals or whatever they want to call it. But one of the things that we find is that in that, there is a lot of emptiness because there's, they're trying to pull from themselves and trying to draw from themselves and say, there's something inside of me that I got to pull out to motivate me to, to continue put, put moving forward. But mantra, when we, we, we talked about this term last week, it's a Hindu term, um, and one of the things that we said is there are a lot of mantras out there. A couple of them are Hakuna Matata and uh, what would Jesus do, all these mantras that exist. But we wanted to base some mantras that will inspire us, that would move us forward, that would affirm uh, our purpose to help us change direction, to keep us focused, that are based in biblical principles. And last week when we started, we said, be the branch. And when we talked about being the branch, it's something that I think we get confused. We get confused because we think that we're the vine. But Jesus says, I'm the vine. He says, I am actually the true vine. Uh, which means there's a lot of artificial uh, uh, imposter. Uh, there's a lot of things that are out there that are substituting him. But he says, I am am the vine. And do you know that the vine is the only thing that produces fruit? It is not the branch that produces fruit. It is the vine, which means the vine is the source and the sustenance that makes the tree or the fruit come forward. So we're looking for our fruit, which means if you're saying I'm looking for my fruit, then you are being, you're, you're trying to say that you're the vine. But Jesus tells us that uh, we are not the vine. The vine produces the fruit, and what we connect to leads to the production, all right? And he says that we are the branches. And so last week when we started the series, we said you need to be the branch because our behavior flows from our identity. So if I'm the branch, that means I'm supporting what the vine wants to produce. Pastor Maria reminded me last week at the end of the service, she goes, you know, Pastor, one of the things that that you said, uh, that, that got to me, that you didn't say, but it came to me while you were talking, was that you said that the branches hold and bear the fruit. And she says, and you know, the branch doesn't have a choice on what the vine produces. But many of us are trying to dictate to Jesus what we should be producing. We're trying to dictate to God. She, she should have been up here preaching, but she just got me stirred when I got home. I'm like, that's a whole nother message. Because we are predicting and trying to dictate to our God what our life should be like. When he says, be the branch, which means I need to stay connected to the vine. I need to draw on the vine as my source. And if I'm connected, Fruit will avail itself. And not only just fruit, he says much fruit. Some of us are satisfied with what we did when, when God used us when we first got saved or when we first uh, became one of his children. We, we, we got used to saying, I'm okay with this level of living. I don't want to go deeper. I don't want to pull more. I don't want to grow more. I just want to be at the level that I was back then. And we get comfortable. But he says, I want you to produce much fruit. That means in your 60s. That means in your 80s. And some of you, <laughs> we talked about it last week. We said, some of you, you look like a branch. But you may be just a sucker branch. Do you remember that? And, and it, <laughs> some people said, I got to Google this. I got to make sure this is real. I said, Google it. It is so true. There are sucker branches that attaches itself 
right at the knuckle of the branch, right at the joint where the connection is. And all they're doing is drawing all the resources out of the vine. And they're not, and, and it can stunt the growth of the branches. And so you have to assess, are you a sucker branch just drawing on resources? Or are you going to be used for God? Are you connected to the vine to produce fruit? Which means i got to bear the weight of the tree, bear the weight of the fruit, bear the weight for my brother and my sister. Sometimes I have to be out there standing there even when the wind is blowing and and the fruit can be pushed off the tree. i got to hold it together. Am I there to do that? That was last week. Let's move on to this week. Let's, let's get into this week's lesson. Uh, where we're talking, we're going to continue with the, the, the message mantra. And I want to take us to a, another passage of Scripture. And this, this passage is uh, found in Luke, the fifth chapter. So if you want to get there ahead of me, you can get there. I'll tell you about the background. Jesus has just finished healing a leper. And he told the leper to go show himself to the priest, but don't, don't um, tell anybody who healed you. But the leper was so excited, the leper decided that he wanted to share it with as many people as he could about this man who healed him from leprosy. Now, the thing about this is that there has been no record of a leper being healed since Nehemiah, um, Naaman. Since Naaman, there's been no other record up until this point. So one of the signs that the Messiah was coming was the fact that he had the ability to heal leprosy. That was one of the signs. And so when they heard that this man named Jesus healed a man of leprosy, people got curious. The religious leaders said, we got to check this out. What is going on here that this is happening? So they went to investigate Jesus. And they found themselves in a little podunk town called Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, it was a podunk town, I got to tell you. It was a, a little obscure town, but all these big city people are now coming in to find this Jesus. The person who used to live in this town, you may know this famous person that lived in this town, his name was Peter. He lived lived in this town. Now, I want you to get a picture of this as we're we're, 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 we're gonna go through this story. And I'm gonna tell you a story about, and we're gonna this Bible story, about these different people on the scene in Capernaum. Now, I want you to figure out which one you are. So pay attention, because I want you to, to say, okay, This is me. Because once you know where you are, then behavior flows. Remember I said behavior flows from identity? You can choose to say, I don't want to be this person. I prefer to be this person. See, when I look at the scripture, I I look at scripture and I read it and I put myself on the pages. I put myself in, like, in the movie. You know? Some people go to the movies and they just visualize and say, oh, look at what they do. I put myself in it. Man, if I could do this, this is what I would be doing, right? And so I want you to sit today, listen to me, and I want you to put yourself in this scene. There's three groups of people, three people that we're talking about. Which one are you? So let's go into the story, Luke, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at the 17th verse. Let's follow along. It says, one day, as he was teaching, Pharisees and religion teachers were sitting around. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem to be there. They were there, once again, because Jesus had just healed the leper. And they were coming, these religious leaders, Pharisees that were sitting around, they were coming to be spectators. They were coming to be judgmental and skeptics, assessing, is this Jesus thing a real thing? Is he who he says he is? That's why they're there. So we are already introduced to our first group of people. All right, and so then, let's go on. It says, some men arrived carrying 
a paraplegic on a stretcher. They were looking for a way to get into the house and set him before Jesus. Now, when you look at this, Mark describes these men. And he tells us there was actually four men that were carrying this man to see Jesus. Now, they too, they didn't experience the miracle. They did not see Jesus heal the leper, but they heard of it. And they said, if he can heal a leper, do you know that means Jesus can do something for me too? And, and maybe let's give him a real difficult challenge. Let's, I, I'm not that much in need, but my friend, Bartholomew over there, he really needs some help. And so let's go and bring Bart to Jesus. Right? And they say, now you got to picture this. Bart is probably, <laughs> y'all laughing at me. Bart is probably sitting there going, don't get me involved in your scheme. Bart is sitting there going, I don't want to be caught up in this. Bart is a paraplegic, and back then, in, in that day, it was almost as if he was invisible. He was obscure. He was not one that, that wanted attention because if you were, had a physical disability back then, they thought it was because a sin that your parent had committed or a sin that you had committed, that there was something wrong with you. So he was used to saying, I don't want to be seen, I don't want to be heard, I don't want to bring attention to me because people are going to judge me. They're not, they're not just condemning him or shaming him because of his condition. They're judging him beyond his physical status. They're judging him and saying, you did something wrong. And so here it is, we have the religious leaders and this crowd of people that are sitting in the house. We have these four men, these friends. By the way, I would love to have friends that look after me like this, who sit there and say, I want to bring you to have your life changed. I want to bring you to a man. I'm going to do something that's going to change your life. That's the type of friends that picked up this paraplegic and brought him to this house. Let's follow along. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, when they couldn't find their way into the house because of the crowd, what do you do when your path is blocked? I want you to start thinking about that. What do you do when you can't find a way in. What do you do when someone is preventing access? What do you do? Do you give up? Do you say, I'll see it later? I'll, I'll come back later? Do you sit there and say, well, it's just too expensive. I don't, I don't want to keep wasting money after this. Do you say, well, it's going to cost me too much time and, and my time is valuable and, and it's just too much time for me, so I'm just going to leave it all together? What do you do when you're being inconvenienced and you figure that it must not be God's time to heal me because I got all these paths blocked? It's not easy to get what I came for when I'm trying to come to see Jesus. What do you do? You know, and, 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 and the scripture says that the crowd was blocking them, was blocking these four men. The crowd who is in church, let's put it that way, facing the speaker with their backs against the needs of the world. They're there to listen. They're there to be skeptics. They're there to criticize. They're there to judge. They're there to assess. But their backs are against the people that need Jesus the most. Are you, the door is locked back there. Somebody opened up the door. Would you <laughs> look at yourself and say, am I a part of the crowd? Am I one where my experience is the only thing that matters? 
Is it my experience? What I get to get out of church today is the only thing that matters. Is what, what my spiritual connection is to God. Because we talked about connection yesterday. That's where we started. Last week, that's where we started. Yeah, connection is important. But is that the only thing that matters? Oh, I, I have a spiritual relationship. Nothing else really matter. I'm not concerned about the loss. I'm not concerned about others. You know, I give, then it must be the church's job or some other people's jobs to do the rest. You know, I show up, at least I'm there, but it's somebody else's job to speak to people. It's not my job. I don't like to speak to people. I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. But I'm connected but, but I don't have a care for the people behind my back. People who come late, the people who don't show up, the people who want to get to Jesus but can't get to him because you got their spot. You're blocking access to Jesus. I know this isn't popular, but am I a part of the crowd? that is there for the experience, there for mine. We used to call it the other, you know, I'm there to get my shout on. You may not shout, but I'm going to get my shout on. Even praise and worship leaders would say, if you don't shout, I'm going to shout for you, which means I'm going to do it. It's all about me. It ain't about you. Well, maybe they can't shout because they're still paralyzed. Maybe because they're a paraplegic and they're sitting there saying, I'm trying to get the healing that I need from Jesus, but you don't care. All you're worried about is getting mine. I'm the priority here. I'm trying to figure this out on my own, and, and I don't care about the broken people that is trying to get into the house. Let's go on. I, know, I don't want to stay there too long. But he says, when they couldn't find a way in, because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. Now let's talk about these boys. They went up on the roof and removed some tiles and let him down in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Could you imagine that conversation before they went up to the roof? These four men, they realize they can't get in the window, they can't get in, in the house, and so they sit there and they're saying, so what do we do? We can't get nowhere near this man. And, 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 and And then you hear Solomon speak up, and he says, well, guys, I got an idea. Let's go up to the roof. Now, Solomon is snaggletooth, got a pickup truck outside, and and he's got a T-shirt on, and and I told you it's a podunk town. And and so he's out there, and he goes, you're sitting there going, well, do I really want to listen to Solomon? Solomon comes up with some wild, crazy ideas every now and then. I didn't describe you, was I? <laughs> I'm talking to the camera. I'm talking to the camera. <laughs> but, but Solomon comes up with some wild, crazy ideas. But the other boys said, well, most people would walk away. Most people would just say, forget it. He's got to lead a house at some point. I catch him in. But no, Solomon said, let's go up to the roof. And so they go, all right. And they climb the roof, and we think it was just some straw. But back then, the houses didn't have straw as their roof. They had tiles. And so there had to be digging, and there had to be busting up of things. And, and they started, these friends started digging and busting up some things. And, and I'm quite sure the people in the, middle, in the house is sitting there going, well, who's on the roof? What are they doing up there? And, 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 and they keep hearing more digging and scraping and, and, and busting up of tile. And then finally they see an opening appear above their heads. And dust and, and dirt is flying in all over them. And they see a head and a hand peek through and they say, what is going on? Why are these people, I could imagine Peter, they assumed this was Peter's house. Right, because Peter lived in Capernaum. And so <laughs> I could see Peter go, well, what are these people doing to my house? 
And then they lower the man down right in front of Jesus. <laughs> and I want to know, are you the type of friend that has an, a bias for action? Are you the type of friend that says, I'm going to do whatever it takes, this is the mantra for the week, to wreck the roof for people to get to Jesus. I'm going to bust up, crack up, dig up any way I can. I'm going to make myself available, not for my sake, not for my experience, but so that someone else behind me it may be your kids, which means I may have to come to church and I know I'm tired of my kids sometimes. And yeah, but maybe I'll serve one, once every two months back in student ministry so my kids know that I'm just as committed about my faith as they, that, 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 that I want them to be. And so I'm ready to wreck the roof. I'm ready to get dirty. Maybe it's something that you're saying, well, maybe I'll come and I'll, 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 I'll start going down my neighborhood and Miss Jenkins is all always by herself. And man, her breath smells so bad that, but I'm going to bear it for the day. I'm going to get her in my car. I'll turn on the vents. I got an air freshener blown in my face. And I'm going to invite Miss Jenkins to church so that I can get her to Jesus. Who are you concerned about? Are we concerned about more than our experience? That we're willing to wreck the roof type of people that will do whatever it takes. Maybe it's I'll come and every Sunday I'm going to video pastor preaching so that we can post it to TikTok. I'll clip it. I'll post it on TikTok so people in the world can come and see about Jesus. You see, maybe I have to do something different. Maybe church looks different for some other people. And maybe we have to think a little different. And maybe we can't do what we did pre-COVID. Maybe we have to do what we did pre-COVID and come up with a whole way of doing things post-COVID. That, that now, you know, I, I want to stay away, but I, I have a role that I have to play. I've stopped bringing people to Jesus. I stop concerning myself about what's important in life, which is making sure that no one is lost. I'm going to be a wreck the roof type of person that brings people to my master. If I have to change the environment, I'm going to change the environment. I'm going to rip up things. I'm going to smash things to change the atmosphere. What is it going to be for you, it may not make sense. It may be old Solomon's crazy ideas that you're following, but you said, you know what? Some of those crazy ideas get people to Jesus. I'm going to be one that's going to do what it takes to impact one person at a time. I may not impact the masses. I may not stand up and sing with the praise team, and, and I may not get up and preach a sermon, but I can help change one person's life at a time. These friends didn't try to change the whole community. They brought their friend to Jesus. They said, I'm not concerned about everybody else, but I am concerned about the person that I, I, I spend time with, that I know well, and I'm going to bring Bart to Jesus. And I know we have a digital world today, and, and we may say, well, we, I'm, I'm comfortable doing church at home. And yeah, you may be, but what are the opportunities you're missing bringing people to Jesus? Are you throwing a watch party? Okay. If you're gonna if you're gonna do church at home, then throw a watch party. Do something that you're saying, I'm ready to make sure I am there to wreck the roof to get one at a time to the master. 
I want to call us to this mantra. And some of you are saying, I can see it for the church, but do you see it in your own life? Where are you re- a wreck the roof type of person in your own life? Some of you have been living it so safe and so, and so, so safe and comfortable that you don't even go out and say hi, hi to your neighbor. You, you, you know your neighbor's outside doing the lawn, raking re- leaves, and you know what you do? You, you, you speed up to pull into the driveway so they don't see you by the time they lift up their head from, from pulling up the leaves and putting in a bag. You, you don't want them to see you, so you rush into the driveway. <laughs> Rush into the garage so that they miss you all together. What are we doing? We are not concerned about it. When you can, you're having a barbecue and you know the person next door have no friends and you don't invite them over. They may be cantankerous, but maybe they'll see that you are a wrecked the roof type of person and that you reach out to them, even though they're pointy and they, they, they're like a porcupine, they stick, and the, and the barb sticks in you. Even though they, they're uncomfortable and they're a little prickly at times, can I deal with the inconvenience of being pricked to make sure they see the love of God and get to Jesus? We want to be a wreck the roof type of person. Are you willing to wreck the roof? If your finances are all jacked up, are you willing to wreck what you've been doing and say, I'm, we got a finance connect group on, on Tuesday night here at the church, 7 o'clock. You know, come, this is not too late. You know, maybe I need to wreck the roof. I need to wreck some of the things that I've been doing and model my, my finances after what the biblical definition of how to manage your finances are. Maybe I can excel in this. And it's not because the church wants something, because it's not. This is for you and your health, for you and your family. How can I do better in this space so that my, I leave a legacy for my kids. I don't have to struggle as much as I'm struggling. Yeah, it may be a temporary setback. It may be a temporary lockdown and, and, and cutting up of your credit cards. Don't cancel them. Cut them up. I just gave you a tip on financial security. <laughs> don't, don't cancel your credit cards. Cut them up. That means you're not using it, but you have the credit available to you. That makes a difference. And so, cut them up, and then, yeah, I may not be able to get that 70-inch Samsung TV at Best Buy that's only 585. It's the cheapest I've ever seen it. I've been waiting so long, Pastor. Wait a little bit longer. But we need to be a smash the roof type of person. I got to wreck this so because I'm going to order my life after what God is telling me to do so that I can have an abundant, prosperous life. Where is it that you need to wreck the roof? Things that, were, that, that are, are patterns in your life that you're sitting there going, I keep falling into the same pattern. That means you keep looking at that same old type of guy that you keep getting attracted to. You keep getting attracted, and you see the going, I don't know what's wrong, Pastor. How did I keep getting into this situation? Because you need to wreck the roof. Change your whole paradigm of what you think is attractive. Maybe you need to go after that crazy old Solomon with the holes in the, cha- in the shirt. <laughs> Snaggle to, hey, but he's going to treat you right. Maybe I got to wreck my paradigm. We're the wreck the roof type of people. That's the mantra for the week. Wreck the roof. Where is it that I need to be a wreck the roof type of person? Impacting somebody's life one at a time. Impressed, let me go on, by (laughs) their bold beliefs. Jesus said, friend, I forgive your sin. Now I'm quite sure that the, the friends on the roof, the men on the roof, 
They were like, wow, Jesus is impressed. Look, he's about to do something. He's about to do something. And he says, he turns around, he goes, um, your sins are forgiven. Uh, um, wait a minute, I'm sorry, excuse me? What did he just say? That, that's not what I expected him to do. That's not what I, I expected him to, to do for him. What, why is he saying that he needs to walk, but he's forgiving his, his sins? And I think this is an important lesson, is that, that we underestimate what we so desperately need. We so underestimate what we desperately need. We think that it is the healing. We think it is the car. We think it is the big house. We think it's the... No. No. We need to recognize the value of forgiveness. We need to recognize the value that Jesus says, you come to me first, not because of what I can do for your circumstance, not because of what I can do for your situation, but if you want to be completely made whole, and from the inside, it starts on the inside, and it works its way out. Let me forgive your soul, and you'll start seeing the budding of fruit that you've never seen before. But let's start by forgiveness. Let's stop underestimating what we so desperately need. So some of us, let me go back to the context now, some of us come to church and we sit there going, well, I can't do those things one person at a time because I need this to happen in my life before I can do that for somebody else. I need my finances to be right before I can help somebody. Why don't you help each other together? I need to do this before this. You underestimate. The first thing you need to realize is that you're completely forgiven. And that is the most important condition that you ever need. Is if you know that I am the righteousness of God and I am forgiven by him, that is the bud of every fruit that will begin to flourish itself in your life. And so if I start there and say, I don't have to worry about where I am and what my circumstances are, I can still impact one for the king. Regardless of how messy I am. Regardless of how broken I am. Let us two broken people find our hope, our faith, our future in the master. That's what we need to be. Say, it doesn't matter. People used to come and say, I would do uh, marriage counseling, and as I'm counseling another couple, and I'm listening to the, the complaints that the, the, the wife is having uh, with her husband, and I'm sitting here going, that's me. I do that. That's me. <laughs> I guess I'm broken too. <laughs> you know? and, and, and it's so true. I, I became healed from listening <laughs> To you. <laughs> I realized that there were things in my life that I needed to improve them on because of you were going through your struggle and I didn't think I had a problem. Do you know? <laughs> the men on the roof didn't realize. They thought they were bringing the paraplegic to be, for, to be healed. But they were praised by the master because of their faith. Their faith was the, what was recognized. Not the paraplegic. Do you know, because you're listening to broken people, do you know you can be healed, set free, and delivered because you were concerned about getting them to Jesus? Uh, your circumstances and situation is secondary. We need to stop underestimating our most deep need. He says, but the Pharisees. So that's the paralegal. So we talked about the three, the three groups already. We talked about the crowd. We talked about the friends. And we talked about the paraplegic. Where do you fall? Where do you find yourself? It says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. They were so stuck in their view about how God works. They were so stuck 
in their tradition and their religious upbringing that they said, this is the way God uses people. These are, this is how God do things. That they concerned about the how, the who. They're concerned about when he does it, his work. They're concerned about all that stuff, but they're not concerned about the loss. Where are you stuck in this paradigm? This is how it should be done. And so you sit back and nothing gets done. Because you're worried about how it should be done and could be done. When God is calling you to do whatever it takes for one to reach the master. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven, Jesus says? Or stand up and walk. He says, is it, you, you think it's easy? And the reason why he's saying this is because there is no visible evidence when he says your sin is forgiven that this man has had a change in his life. There's no visible evidence appearing on the outside. So none of these men would, would say, well, what does that mean? This man can walk up. That's not true. So he says, it, it's easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or is it easier for me to say Stand up and walk. Now they know if he says, stand up and walk, and this man gets up, that's truly miraculous. He goes, well, since you can't decide, I'll decide for you. Uh, he says, uh, so I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. I'll prove to you that I have the authority. Jesus did it to prove to the man and to prove to the people there his authority. He didn't do it because the man was paraplegic. He did it to approve his authority. Does Jesus have authority in your life? Are you allowing him to demonstrate the authority that he has in your life? Or are we stuck battling over the throne? Battling over the throne. I'm in control. I'm the one who's going to direct my own destiny. I'm the one who's going to determine this. Are we going to let Jesus have the authority in our lives? First, over our sin. Second, over our actions. Our bias for action. Are we going to allow Jesus to have the last say? Are we going to sit back and say, that's not in the agenda today, Jesus. That's not for you to do today, Jesus. That's not for me to do. And Jesus says, I want you to be wreck the roof people. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up picked up his mat, and went home praising God as everyone watched. As everyone sat there gawking, this man got up. This man praised. This man said, I'm not going to be like them. I recognize who this man is. If you've been ever touched by the master, you should be sitting and going, I, kn I know who this man is. I'm not going to sit and gawk and watch, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to, because my life has been changed. My life has been changed. I've been set free. I've been delivered. I'm not going to sit and watch. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Are you the type of person who just want to be at the movies, watching it, or do you want to be what they're writing about in the movie? Do you want to be the, the character that's making the change, that are doing the heroic stuff in the movies. I don't want to be there watching heroic acts. I want to be a part of it. I can sit and watch and say, oh, that's amazing. Or I can get in the game and be a 
a, a person that wrecks the roof. I think all too often we say, well, we're the crowd. And we're blocking and we're looking for an awe, a show. We're looking for, for an experience. Well, we can be a part of the experience. We can be contributors to what God is trying to do. In fact, that's what he calls us to do, to contribute into what he's doing to change a nation, to change our communities, to change the world. Or are we going to just sit back, amazed at somebody else? I believe God is calling us to wreck the roof. We have a, a saying in our values here. We say that, that we will do anything short of sin to reach one for him. We'll do anything short of sin to reach one for him. I don't know if, if, if we're all excited about that. I don't, when I, when I hear, even today, I, I heard, you know, you got three people that canceled, couldn't do, uh, couldn't serve today, couldn't serve in, in our student ministries today. And I'm going, are we wreck the roof type of people? Or are we going to be people that say, I'm going to do whatever it takes so that our babies get to experience Jesus? We have kids that are hurting in this church, experiencing things that, that we, we hope our kids would never experience. But yet they are facing things that are challenging and they need wreck the roof type of people committed to them saying I'm going to do whatever it takes so they get to experience the Jesus that I know and I'm not just talking about here I'm talking about in our community as well start inviting your kids friends over to your house so they could see the type of life that is connected to the vine. So they could see Jesus in you. You may be the kindest, most welcoming person that they have ever experienced that week. It doesn't happen in just church. It happens in your neighborhood, in your community. Invite them to lunch. It may be the only meal they have. One in six. People go hungry. That means there's someone in this church right now, we have more than six. One in six. We need to be wrecked the roof people. We need to be concerned. Those that are our backs are too. As we listen to the word, we need to leave being messengers of the word living vessels of the word. God is calling us to be a wreck the roof church. That means we have to do things differently too. I'm trying to figure, I can't figure it out on my own. I need people around me and around Pastor Maria that help give us ideas, to help shape it. We can't do everything, but maybe you can. With your help, we can with your help, you can say, I know, I don't even want this to be called a church thing, but I'm going to do it so that, so that the God gets the glory. I don't care whose name is on it. <laughs> do it so that one person at a time gets to the master. Why don't you stand with me? Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the revelation of that you called us to be friends in relationship with others that are not like us, in relationship with people that are different, in relationship with people that maybe that you providentially placed us in their path. We didn't even have a relationship, but we just happened to bump, bump into them on a bus. And they said, you can find Jesus over here. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you that you are positioning us to not only hear your word, but commissioning us to be the hands, the feet, the branches 
that hold up the weight of those that are struggling, those that are lost, so they can get a taste of the fruit that only you can provide. Lord God, I thank you that right now that you're giving me the courage. You're opening my eyes at opportunities and you're giving me the courage to, to take a step, to walk towards what you have ordained for my life, what you have put in my path for me to do. Lord, allow me the courage to submit to your authority, to get involved, to do more than what I've been doing and letting others just handle it for me. But Lord, I recognize that without you, I'm empty. So I'm going to draw on you. You are the source. You're going to be my strength. And I'm, you will be the one that directs my path. Lord God, right, somebody on the sound of my voice who have struggled, have, have done all they could today to get to hear a message about Jesus, about what Jesus do. And, and I realize that now that they realize that forgiveness is the most important thing, not the change in their circumstances and situation. Although those are important things, Jesus, and you care about those. You first care about my soul. Lord God, today someone is asking for forgiveness. Lord God, I know that you are already forgiven them. As they acknowledge you as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord God, as they acknowledge you as their Lord and Savior, authority over their life. Lord God, you've adopted them into the family. And Lord God, we thank you today. We praise you. We lift you up for that child, that boy, that girl, that man, that woman that have come to you today. Lord God, we celebrate you. For your arms are always reaching out to us. And Lord God, we're going to be so careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, let's worship together.